Hello, beautiful souls. Welcome back. I am thrilled to have you join us today for a crucial conversation on colorectal cancer but don't forget to hit that subscribe button and ring the notification bell, because knowledge is power, and together, we can make a difference. Let's get started. Colorectal cancer is a leading cause of morbidity and death in Australia. By the time they are 85 years old, males have an 11% chance of receiving a colon cancer diagnosis, while females have a 16% chance. The incidence rates for people over 50 years of age are rising quickly, while those under 49 years of age are still relatively low, talking about the clinical features. Cologne cancer can present as iron deficiency anemia, rectal bleeding, abdominal pain, change in bowel habits, intestinal obstruction, or perforation. Rectal cancer can present as rectal bleeding, change in bowel habits, often diarrhea, occult bleeding, and abdominal pain. Pelvic pain and urinary symptoms are late signs. In physical findings, during early disease, you can find nonspecific findings such as fatigue, weight loss, or none at all. In more advanced disease, abdominal tenderness, macroscopic rectal bleeding, palpable abdominal mass, hepatomegaly, ascites. For rectal cancer do a digital rectal examination to assess the size, ulceration, and presence of any pararectal lymph nodes, as well as fixation to surrounding structures. In assessing the cancer, we can start with lab studies. These include a complete blood count, serum chemistries, liver and kidney function tests, carcinoembryonic antigen, CEA, test, histologic examination of tissue specimens, in imaging studies. For colon cancer, CT colonoscopy should be considered for a patient with colon cancer if it has not been possible to view the entire colon by colonoscopy due to the risk of synchronous tumors. If CT shows metastatic disease confined to the liver, an MRI of the liver can be considered to assess for resectability, particularly if the background liver parenchyma is abnormal, the patient has recently received chemotherapy, or when a patient cannot have iodinated contrast. For patients with colorectal cancer who have potentially resectable metastatic disease, PET-CT is recommended to detect additional metastases. For patients with stage 2 and 3 disease who have undergone initial surgery and or adjuvant treatment, a suitable approach to imaging surveillance may involve a 12-monthly CT of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis. For patients with stage 4 disease who have undergone a resection procedure with curative intent, a suitable approach to imaging surveillance may involve CT of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis every 6 months. For rectal cancer, rigid proctoscopy, flexible sigmoidoscopy, fiber-optic flexible colonoscopy, CT, and double contrast barium enema are options. MRI of the rectum is the recommended staging investigation for rectal cancer. High-resolution sequences must be performed and must meet accepted criteria. Additional sequences coronal to the anal canal are required for low tumors. Template reports are recommended, which include all of distance from the anal verge and puborectal sling for low tumors. Relationship to the peritoneal reflection. T stage, including a spread in MM beyond muscular. N stage and pelvic lymph nodes using morphological criteria. EMVI status. CRM status using 1 mm as a cutoff distance. Studies for molecular markers. Microsatellite instability, MSI. DNA mismatch repair, MMR, MLH1, MSH2, MSH6, and PMS2 DNA mismatch repair status studies should be performed on all cases of colorectal cancer for the detection of Lynch syndrome. BRAF mutation, used to differentiate between sporadic and familial, Lynch syndrome, cases of DNA mismatch repair status deficient colorectal cancer. Extended RAS mutation, carried out on all patients at the time of diagnosis of metastatic colorectal cancer in whom anti-EGFR treatment is being considered. The following represents a flow chart specific for rectal cancer evaluation. After assessing, you can stage the cancer. There are several staging classifications such as Duke staging, TNM staging, and ACPS slash Comford staging. ACPS slash Comford staging system was recommended for use in Australia. The following shows ACPS slash Comford staging. 
Here apical lymph node metastasis is associated with a worse prognosis than local lymph node metastasis. Apical lymph node is defined as a node within 1 cm of the point of highest vascular pedicle ligation. Stage D classifies the presence of residual tumor remaining after surgical resection. This represents the residual tumor R classification. This is done after a management technique has been used to assess the residual. The following is the pathological TNM staging nomenclature to achieve uniformity in the staging of colorectal cancer. The P prefix is used to indicate post-surgical pathological staging. The YP prefix is used to denote the post-surgical TNM stage following neoadjuvant therapy. This slide shows the primary tumor classification. This slide shows the regional lymph node status classification. This slide shows the distant metastasis status classification. This slide shows the modified Duke staging system. It shows the extent of wall involvement with nodal and metastasis. Finally, management of colorectal cancer is a multidisciplinary team approach. For rectal cancer options include chemotherapy, surgery, transanal excision for early stage cancers in a select group of patients, transanal endoscopic microsurgery, endocavity radiotherapy, sphincter sparing procedures, low anterior resection, coloanal anastomosis, abdominal perineal resection, adjuvant chemoradiotherapy. This slide shows the rectal cancer treatment algorithm. It wasn't mentioned in the Cancer Australia guideline, but can help understand the pathway to take for colon cancer, neoadjuvant therapy, surgery, stage 1 to 2 and limited metastatic disease, right hemicolectomy, extended right hemicolectomy, left hemicolectomy, sigmoid colectomy, total abdominal colectomy with ileorectal anastomosis for HNPCC, FAP, metachronous cancers, cryotherapy, radiofrequency ablation, hepatic arterial infusion of chemotherapeutic agents, adjuvant chemoradiotherapy, perioperative care as mentioned in the guideline. Need a multidisciplinary team assessment and psychological intervention during the disease. For anemia managed with allogenic blood transfusion, erythropoiesis stimulating agents, ESAs, and iron supplementation. Provide thromboembolic prophylaxis. Nutritional status is screened in elective surgery. Nutritional risk index and the malnutrition screening tool can be used to screen. Patient-generated subjective global assessment tool is the most accurate. Stomotherapy is seen before surgery by a stomotherapist and given postoperative education. Avoid hypothermia. Temperature is maintained at or above 36.0 C. Can use of warmed four fluids and forced air warming. Enhanced recovery after surgery programs. Mechanical bowel prep and antibiotic prophylaxis, oral laxative, sodium picosulfate, polyethylene glycol, and sodium phosphate, but studies show no when comparing patients who received MVP to no MVP, regardless of antibiotics administered. Mechanical bowel preparation should not be used routinely in colonic surgery. It can be used selectively, surgical management as mentioned in the guideline. Elective resection for colon cancers, either an open approach or a laparoscopic approach, but laparoscopic colectomy has postoperative advantages so must be the first choice. Elective resection for rectal cancer, open surgery, is the standard approach. Laparoscopic resection can be considered in selected cases with the necessary expertise and infrastructure. Done utilizing the principles of total mesorectal resection. For T1 rectal tumors local excision can be considered but the risk of local recurrence increases as the T1 tumor stage progresses. For T1 SM3 tumors and T2 tumors, consider radical resection as the first option. Radiotherapy before or after local excision of rectal cancer may reduce the risk of local recurrence. However, it may harm bowel function. Emergency management of malignant large bowel obstruction as mentioned in the guideline. Approaches are stenting or colostomy and acute resection with primary anastomosis. In patients with acute obstruction due to left-sided colorectal cancer who are potentially curative, the use of stenting as a bridge to surgery is not recommended as standard treatment due to the potential risk of tumor perforation and conversion of a curative case to a palliative case. 
However, for those at risk of postoperative mortality, stent placement may be considered as an alternative to emergency surgery. The insertion of an intraluminal colonic stent can be considered in large bowel obstruction secondary to colorectal cancer as palliation to relieve large bowel obstruction in patients with incurable metastatic colorectal cancer. Antibeg systemic therapy may be contraindicated in the presence of a stent, as there is evidence that the risk of perforation is increased for peritoneal occurrences mentioned in the guideline. For colorectal cancer and peritoneal involvement or isolated peritoneal recurrence of colorectal cancer. For colorectal peritoneal metastases, either synchronous or metachronous to the primary, consider cytoreduction with perioperative intraperitoneal chemotherapy. Done after a discussion with the patient about the potential treatment-related mortality and morbidity, adjuvant therapy for colon cancer as mentioned in the guideline. Adjuvant chemotherapy is a postoperative treatment that aims to decrease relapse and improve overall survival by attempting to eliminate this microscopic residual disease. Six months of adjuvant chemotherapy should be offered to patients with stage 3 colon cancer, improving survival. Oxaliplatin in combination with fluoropyrimidine is standard therapy for young patients, less than 70 years, with stage 3 colon cancer, but did not improve survival outcomes in greater than 70 years. Capecitabine plus oxaliplatin, Zelox, can be considered as an alternative to Falfox for adjuvant treatment for patients with stage 3 colon cancer. Elderly patients, greater than or equal to 70 years, with stage 3 colon cancer who are fit for adjuvant chemotherapy should receive 6 months of a single-agent fluoropyrimidine, either 5-FU or capecitabine. A combination of oxaliplatin and fluoropyrimidine-based therapy in the metastatic setting provides a similar benefit in elderly patients and younger patients. For stage 2 adjuvant therapy can be considered in high-risk patients on a case-by-case -case basis. Neither irinotecan nor a biological agent, either bevacizumab or cetuximab, should be used as adjuvant therapy for patients with stage 2 or 3 colon cancer, neoadjuvant and adjuvant therapy for rectal cancer, as mentioned in the guideline. Neoadjuvant refers to treatment given before the definitive treatment. It reduces the risk of local and distant recurrence and also downstages the cancer. Upper cancers are where the inferior margin located at 10 to 15 cm from the anal margin does not require treatment with neoadjuvant therapy, and overall management, including adjuvant therapy, should follow that of colon cancers. Neoadjuvant therapy, radiation, with or without chemotherapy, followed by surgery, is current practice for managing most mid-low rectal cancers that are T3 and or N1. Early CT3 N0 rectal cancer, less than 1 mm extension, is considered potentially suitable for surgery without neoadjuvant treatment in some international guidelines, but requires a high level of confidence in staging investigations and interpretation. A watch-and-wait approach for patients with clinical complete response following chemoradiation is not considered standard practice. There is an increased risk of recurrence necessitating surgical intervention and the importance of close follow-up with tests such as serial CEA measurements, clinical examination, radiological surveillance, and sigmoidoscopy slash colonoscopy. Infusional fluoropyrimidine chemotherapy is the standard choice of radiation sensitizers for use in combination with radiation treatment. Oral capacitabine or intravenous infusional 5-FU are both acceptable. Surgery is done 6 to 8 weeks after. Adjuvant therapy, no strong evidence for the benefit of adjuvant chemotherapy after preoperative neoadjuvant therapy. Patients with upper third rectal tumors, 10 to 15 cm from the anal verge, with either CN plus or PN plus findings are possibly those who may derive any slash most benefit from adjuvant chemotherapy. Higher risk disease postoperatively who did not receive neoadjuvant treatment should be considered for adjuvant pelvic radiotherapy concurrent with 5-fluorouracil chemotherapy. For patients with metastatic colorectal cancer, a continuum of care approach is now favored. Talking about the management of resectable locally recurrent and metastatic disease, as stated in the guidelines. Local regional recurrences refers to anastomotic recurrences, recurrences in the surgical bed, or regional nodal recurrences. Initial assessment with a suspected recurrence should include serum CEA, contrast CT scan of the chest, abdomen, and pelvis, unless contraindicated, and PET. 
depending on the type of recurrence, additional investigations are likely to be necessary such as pelvic MRI. Disodium gadoxitate, primavist, contrast, can increase the sensitivity and specificity of MRI for detecting liver metastases. If possible, histologically confirmed before surgery. Re-resection for locally recurrent colorectal cancer should be undertaken where possible with a clear resection margin and with curative intent called pelvic exenteration. This is offered when a cure is considered possible as associated with significant morbidity. Radiotherapy-naive patients with locally recurrent rectal cancer should receive neoadjuvant chemoradiation before curative surgery. Management of unresectable locally recurrent and metastatic disease, as stated in the guidelines. Multidisciplinary team management with palliative care as the major goal. For synchronous metastasis, resection of asymptomatic primary lesions remains controversial. Asymptomatic lesions with good disease control after initial systemic therapy can be evaluated for resection without widespread progression. For patients with a symptomatic primary tumor, obstruction, bleeding, or perforation, and synchronous metastatic disease, resection of the primary tumor should be considered before initiation of systemic therapy. For candidates not suitable for primary tumor resection other palliative options to control symptoms including surgical bypass, radiotherapy, stents, laser ablation in addition to systemic treatment should be considered. For patients with unresectable metastatic rectal cancer with symptomatic primary tumor, irradiation, plus or minus chemotherapy, of the primary tumor should be considered after. Systemic therapies in non-resectable metastatic colorectal cancer, as stated in the guidelines. Fluoropyrimidines. Irinotecan. Oxaliplatin. Monoclonal antibodies targeting EGFR, cetuximab and panitumumab be used in patients with RAS wild-type tumors, be used in combination with Falfiri or Falfox, but not be combined with capecitabine-based and bolus 5 foo based regimen. Monoclonal antibodies targeting vascular endothelial growth factor, betacizumab, remusarumab, should be used in combination with cytotoxic doublets, including Falfox, Zelox, and Falfiri, triplet cytotoxic regimen, Falfoxari, in select fit patients where tumor shrinkage is the goal. Aflabercept. Regorafenib. Trifluoridine typeracil. Anti-EGFR or anti-VEGFIN combination with chemotherapy are recommended in the first-line treatment of most patients unless contraindicated. Left-sided primary tumors have a favorable outcome compared with those with right-sided tumors regardless of treatment type received. Left-sided colorectal cancer should be considered for initial doublet chemotherapy and anti-EGFR therapy. Right-sided colorectal cancer should be considered for initial doublet chemotherapy plus or minus anti-VEGF. Second line, patients who did not receive bevacizumab as part of first-line therapy should be considered for bevacizumab, in combination with a second-line cytotoxic regimen. Patients who received bevacizumab as part of the first-line regimen and have RAS wild-type, BRAF wild-type, metastatic colorectal cancer should be considered for combination EGFR monoclonal antibodies with falfiri slash irinotecan. Patients who received a first-line oxaliplatin-containing regimen should be switched to an irinotecan-containing regimen, and vice versa. Patients who experience disease progression during first-line 5 foo monotherapy should be offered an irinotecan or oxaliplatin-containing regimen if they have adequate performance status. Third-line, cetuximab or panitumumab treatment is given not previously treated with these. Regorafenib or trifluoridine slash typeracil can be considered if refractory to standard care. Early palliative care, follow-up after curative resection, as stated in the guideline. Offered to follow-up with CEA, CT, and PET for detection of recurrence or residual disease. Patients who are unfit for further surgery or who have advanced disease require appropriate follow-up directed at psychological support and symptom relief. Colonoscopy should be performed at 12 months after surgery. If the initial colonoscopy was incomplete, then a colonoscopy should be performed at the latest 6 months after surgery. Prevention and screening, as mentioned in the guideline. Prevention of colorectal cancer includes Primary prevention through chemoprevention, dietary, and lifestyle modifications. Early detection and removal of precursor lesions such as the adenomatous polyp. 
environmental risk factors, tobacco smoking, reduced physical activity, foods containing dietary fiber and increased red meat, processed meat, alcoholic drinks, men, body fatness, abdominal fatness, adult attained height, it is a marker for genetic, environmental, hormonal, and also nutritional factors affecting growth. Probable risk factors include reduced garlic, milk, calcium. Suggestive factors are decreased non-starchy vegetables, fruits, foods containing vitamin D3, and increased foods containing iron, cheese, foods containing animal fats, and foods containing sugars. So avoiding these risk factors is a mode of primary prevention. Avoid alcohol or at least limit intake to less than two standard drinks per day. Strong evidence for benefit has emerged from exposure to nonsteroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, especially aspirin in low- and high-risk populations. Evidence from all trials showed a significant reduction in the incidence of proximal colon cancer compared to distal colon cancer in those taking aspirin. The benefit is attenuated distally. A low dose of aspirin can be given for at least 2.5 years. People who are at high risk of colorectal cancer due to Lynch syndrome carrier status should be advised to begin aspirin from the commencement of their colonoscopy screening, usually at age 25 years, where surgery is inappropriate for people with familial adenomatous polyposis, an NSAID, e.g. Solendac, is recommended. Even though statins and metformin have chemopreventive properties without RCT evidence, they cannot be recommended for chemoprevention at this time. Population screening. The recommended strategy for population screening in Australia, directed at those at average risk of colorectal cancer and without relevant symptoms, is immunochemical fecal occult blood testing every two years, starting at age 45 years and continuing to age 74 years. The use of flexible sigmoidoscopy as a primary screening test is not recommended for population screening in the average risk population. Extending the upper limit of the age range from 74 to 79 or 84 years is not recommended for population screening because the likely benefits do not outweigh the risks. People aged 75 to 85 years who are fit, well, and healthy, who request screening after about the benefits and potential harms of testing, could consider offering an immunochemical fecal occult blood test, and for people aged 40 to 44 years every two years until the national program. The emerging fecal, blood, or serum tests for cancer-specific biomarkers such as DNA are not recommended as population screening modalities for colorectal cancer at this time. Participation in a population screening program is not recommended for people with symptoms such as rectal bleeding or persistent change in bowel habits or with iron deficiency anemia, nor for those who should be having regular surveillance or screening based on colonoscopy, for example for past colorectal cancer or adenoma, chronic inflammatory bowel disease, a strong family history of colorectal cancer, or a high-risk genetic cancer syndrome. Patients need to undergo a high-quality diagnostic colonoscopy within 120 days after a positive immunochemical fecal occult blood test. If the findings do not require further colonoscopy follow-up, the National Bowel Cancer Screening Program participant should skip the next round of IFOBT screening. Contaminated IFOBT must be repeated in six weeks. The following shows the categorization of patients according to the risk they have of developing cancer based on family history as mentioned in the guideline. There are three categories with increasing risk. Include both sides of the family when assessing an individual's risk category for colorectal cancer. Because of the possibility of Lynch syndrome, the accuracy of the family history of cancer diagnoses and polyp pathology should be checked carefully. After categorizing the patient according to the risk, the guideline presents the screening strategies for each category. In Category 1 Fecal Immunochemical Test with Low-Dose Aspirin In Category 2 Colonoscopy with Aspirin In Category 3 Colonoscopy, Aspirin, and Referral to a Family Cancer Clinic Those at risk of colorectal cancer should be carefully checked for the presence of symptoms and appropriate diagnostic investigation completed before entry into a screening program. For people in Category 2, CT colonography can be offered if the patient had an incomplete colonoscopy in the three months before the scan, there is a high-grade colonic obstruction, or the service is requested by a specialist. 
Consider tumor testing in affected relatives for Lynch syndrome-related changes using immunohistochemistry and microsatellite instability analysis. A diagnostic interval of 120 days should be the maximum time from the first healthcare presentation to diagnostic colonoscopy for triage categories 1 and 2, whether it is for a patient with symptoms or after a positive IFOBT used for colorectal cancer screening. Patients presenting with colorectal cancer must be assessed for the risk of familial syndromes. These conditions increase the risk of the condition for other family members so they can be screened as early as possible. So we need to identify and follow up regularly. Familial adenomatous polyposis, an autosomal dominant inherited disorder, characterized by the early onset of hundreds to thousands of adenomatous polyps throughout the colon. Genetic testing is indicated for persons with a cumulative count of greater than or equal to 10 colorectal adenomas before 30 years of age or greater than or equal to 20 colorectal adenomas at any age. Colonic surveillance should be offered to individuals found on genetic testing to carry a pathogenic APC mutation and first-degree relatives of patients with FAP or AFAP in whom genetic testing has been declined or is not possible because the family mutation has not been identified. Commence from age 10 to 15 years or earlier if there are gastrointestinal symptoms. With classical FAP, flexible sigmoidoscopy is adequate. Classical FAP, colectomy, is required. Where surgery is inappropriate an NSAID is recommended. Muti-associated polyposis, autosomal recessive syndrome. Testing is indicated for persons with a cumulative count of greater than or equal to 20 colorectal adenomas at any age siblings of a mutibiallelic mutation carrier. Also considered in patients with greater than or equal to 10 adenomas and any of the following, age under 50, synchronous colorectal cancer, both adenomatous and serrated polyps where the adenomatous polyps dominate, family history suggestive of recessive inheritance. Biallelic mutation carriers should have a colonoscopy every two years, starting at age 18 to 20 years. If polyps are detected, an annual colonoscopy may be required to control the polyp burden. If polyps cannot be easily managed colonoscopically, a colectomy with ileorectal anastomosis should be considered and discussed with the patient. The residual rectum requires annual surveillance. Lynch syndrome, autosomal dominant syndrome. All colorectal cancers should be tested for mismatch repair deficiency as a means to subsequently identify Lynch syndrome. Juvenile polyposis syndrome. In patients with a diagnosis of juvenile polyposis syndrome, colonoscopy should commence at age 12 to 15 or earlier if symptoms occur. It should be repeated every one to three years, depending on polyp burden. Colectomy is indicated if polyps cannot be managed endoscopically. Serrated polyposis syndrome. Colonoscopy should be performed every one to three years to remove all polyps greater than or equal to 5 mm. If the number and size of polyps make it impossible to achieve this, colectomy and ileorectal anastomosis should be considered. Patients who have adenomatous polyps removed at colonoscopy are then classified as having an above-average risk for the development of metachronous adenomatous polyps and CRC. The following table, which was present in RACGP guidelines, provides advice about colonoscopic surveillance and recommended frequency based on the number and histology of polyps. We wrap up today's exploration of colorectal cancer with guidelines specific to Cancer Council Australia. It's crucial to ensure that you and your loved ones are up to date with screening. If you found this video helpful or informative, don't forget to hit the like button and share it with your friends and family. Subscribe to our channel for more insightful content on various health topics. Thank you for joining us today. Stay well, stay informed, and take care of yourself. Until next time.